All right, so this today's lecture is on the Franks and Charlemagne. So our last lecture was on Islam and the spread of Islam. So we're now shifting back to Europe, getting back to uh, look and see what's happening in Europe at these times. The German tribe we're going to look at is the Franks, and then eventually they will end up with a great King Charlemagne. So we're looking at the 500s. This is the time when Europe is in the Dark Ages, and then 800 will be the year that Charlemagne gets crowned emperor, and we can kind of mark that as the start of a new age. Uh, the, the, the time is no longer dark in Europe, or not as dark. All right, so we're talking about the German invasions. The fall of Rome, the fall of the western side of the empire was due to the German invasions. Just Germans flooding in all through the 400s. All through the 400s, it's just a floodgate of Germans coming through. One of the tribes we look at is the Franks. I mean, there's lots of tribes, but the one that we know historically to look at is the Franks. They are flooding in in the 450s, so starting in the 400s, and by 450, they're completely moved in across the Rhine River into the area that used to be called Gaul, across the Rhine and into Gaul. Again, there are lots of different tribes, but we look at the, the Franks. Um, it's about this time that the last Roman emperor, the last time that someone wore a crown and called themselves emperor, it's somewhat of no consequence. I mean, the empire is just done. You can pick a time any time through the 400s, but if you actually want to know a date of when someone actually tried to wear a crown, it's 476 is the last time anyone wore a Roman crown. Um, the guy we're looking at, the king of the Franks, as they come into the Roman Empire, what used to be the Roman Empire, and settle in, is a guy named Clovis. He is, will be the, put them on the map as the great, one of the great tribes. He'll be there from 482 to 511. So if you look at the dates there, we're looking right around 500. And we're looking at about 30 years, a 30-year reign for this king. That's impressive. He is the founder of the Merovingian dynasty. This is the line of Frankish kings. I don't hold you responsible for knowing this word, Merovingian dynasty here. Uh, I do want you to know that the Franks, the year's around 500. Um, but the word Merovingian actually gives you a description. If you want to know what these guys look like, the word Merovingian itself means long-haired kings. These guys are Germanic head-bashing barbarians. This is the Dark Age. Looking at the Franks, that's an idealized picture of Clovis there. Um, they are Aryan Christians. As they come into the Roman Empire, they've been Christianized before they even get there. But they've been Christianized in a different way. They've been Christianized by the ideas of Arius. So they're Aryan Christians. Again, nothing to do with Hitler. That's next semester. But the Aryan Christians believe that God is perfect Jesus being a human at one point is not perfect, and then there's the Holy Spirit. So it's almost a polytheistic idea of Christianity. They're Aryan Christians. As Clovis comes in and settles in to Gaul, around the area of Paris, a nice place to settle in, he will convert to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was still standing. As the Dark Ages are going on, all hell's breaking loose. The only thing that still survives is the Catholic Church, and he sees it, and he becomes a Catholic. He will convert to the Catholic ideas. In fact, there's a baptism. This will be quite famous. You'll see lots of pictures of the baptism of Clovis because this is important. With all these Germanic Aryan tribes running around, possibly killing Christians, this is a Frankish tribe who've decided to become Catholic. So now he and his Franks will defend the Catholic Church. That's huge. I mean, Christianity, Catholic Christianity could have been snuffed out. And instead, it will survive and be protected by these Franks. So he's a defender of the Catholic Church. And they also protect him. This is kind of a two-way street. He defends the Catholic churches. And the Catholic churches will tell their congregations to obey the Franks. So it works both for both sides. Again, the baptism is huge. You'll see lots of pictures of Clovis' baptism. Because this announces to all the people to obey Clovis that he is a Catholic so the baptism of Clovis from an Aryan Christian to a Catholic. The word will be sent out that the Germans should, especially these Franks, should become Catholic and support the Catholic Church. Starting off in the area around Paris, in the yellow area there, he'll be attacking to the south, carving that out. He'll be attacking back to the east, back across the Rhine. He'll carve out a territory. So you can see here in the yellow and the orange and the purple, he's carving out a nice territory. The Franks are a really powerful um, Germanic tribe. And they're conquering the other Germanic tribes. Um, Clovis will battle heretics. Now that he is supporting the Catholic Church, he will actually oppose the Arians. 
and other forms of Christianity. What kind of government? If you're the king and you've settled down now in a nice place like Paris, you might want to have a government instead of just running around head bashing people. Um, well, there's a government that you can use. The structure of the church, the Catholic church has survived in these dark ages, and he will use that structure. You have an idea, Roman diocese and Roman structure of churches, and that'll kind of become the structure of government. In fact, it's almost a theocracy. Who are the people obeying? Well, you go to church and you'll obey your churchmen who listen to King Clovis. So it's pretty much a theocracy, keeping monasticism alive. Again, in a dark age, Roman writing and Roman ideas could have been completely snuffed out. And instead, they'll survive in monasteries, and Clovis will support the monasteries. So we keep the monasteries alive, you keep monasticism, because these monks are pretty much the only educated people around. I mean, in a dark age, Latin didn't really survive. But um, you're really looking for these monks, these educated men, they're the only people who can read and write. And so if you're trying to run a government, you need these monks. You're going to support monasticism. Again, dark ages. It's a controversy. A lot of historians say it's not really a dark age. You can't use that word dark age. Well, come on. It's pretty dim. Very, very dark. Through the 400s, when all hell's breaking loose. Through the 500s, it continues. What used to be Roman cities are no more. It'll just be a ghost town, what used to be Roman cities. Uh, Roman culture will pretty much disappear as it used to be. You'll see it replaced with new German traditions. As the Germans come in, they will present their ideas. And so you'll actually see a blending of what used to be Roman ideas and these new German ideas coming together to form an entirely new culture. It's not Roman, it's not German, it's something completely new in what used to be the Roman Empire. And of course, over time they mix. Initially, you'd be afraid of the Germans and they'd hate you and you'd hate them. And then eventually, you know, people, once they get to know each other, they start mixing marriages and the Romans, the Gauls will start mixing with the Franks and blending their traditions. But, you know, it takes hundreds of years and several generations. And so eventually you end up with an entirely new culture. A blending of the old Roman culture with the new German culture. Latin pretty much dies out as a language, except in monasteries. And you'll end up with French, you'll end up with German, you'll end up with Spanish and Italian, all these new languages, all these new cultures. Um, if you want to argue against the Dark Ages, that it wasn't a really a Dark Age, here's what you would point to. You'd point to monasteries, that writing never disappeared. Someone always was able to read and write in Europe. Although I'm talking about a tiny, tiny minority, at least writing didn't dis completely disappear. Inventions. During a dark age, you wouldn't think of inventions, and there actually are inventions that take place in Europe. One of them being the deep plow was invented. A deep plow was a plow that will be over a foot long. The old plows, maybe six inches, turning over six inches of earth over hundreds of years, that depletes the soil. A new deep plow, digging a foot or more into the ground, turns over new soil, so uh, new farming. Better, better, better yields. And to pull that deep plow, you can't pull it by yourself and you, a horse isn't big enough to pull it. You're going to need oxen. And so looking at an ox, that would be an indication this isn't a dark age. During a dark age, you would have to eat the animal just to survive. And instead you see oxen all over Europe pulling deep plows. And so you would argue, well, it's not really a dark age because they have big animals. The water wheel is invented at this time and becomes quite common. A water wheel is when you use a stream or a river to turn a wheel. Perhaps you've seen this. It's really quite pretty. Um, it's actually a very functioning machine. The water turns this wheel, and then inside the little house there, you'll be grinding grain in there. You'll have two rocks and two wheels grinding against each other to grind the grain. So that would you point to. That's not a dark age. That's, that's pretty uh, inventive there. Changes everything about food. Look at your new nobles. So if you survive the dark age... Your new lords are Germans. They come into every town and take over, and they're the new rulers. And again, they are warriors. Germans are warriors. That's how they got there in the first place. The way their system works, this warrior system works, is they receive land from a king. A king will come in and take over areas and take over areas and take over areas, and they'll leave behind their warriors. They will tell their warriors, you fought bravely, and you get this piece, and you get this piece, and you get this piece. So the warriors received land from the king. And this would be done in a public ceremony in the town square. A king would have a ceremony so that everyone could see who your new landlord is, who owns this town, or who owns these fields. 
They're called vassals. A king will have his vassals in a public ceremony so that everyone knows who the Lord is. And this involves oaths. Christian oaths are sworn. Again, nothing in writing here. These people can't read or write. And so it's done with public ceremonies, public oaths, a transfer of land. And again, we haven't mentioned money. There's no money involved here. If you have money, you've got it buried somewhere. This is a system that does not involve money. Um, if taxes are charged, it'll all be taxes in kind. If you own farmland or you own uh, property or cows or something, you pay taxes in kind to your lord. This is a decentralized system. The king himself won't make judgments. You'll never deal with the king. I mean, his high nobles might deal with him, but uh, you wouldn't deal with the king. You would deal with your landlord, your warrior ruler, your warrior lord. That's who you'll go to for justice or for rulings. That's a decentralized system. You'll never deal with anything higher than your lord. That's the feudal system. A system based on oaths, a system based on just face-to-face uh, -face contact, doesn't involve money, taxation is in kind, that's the feudal system. And of course, agriculturally, this is all that's involved here. That's all that you can manage here. Manufacturing has pretty much disappeared. It's an agricultural system without money, based on oaths, transfer of land, kingship, war. The thing we look at, if you're looking at the Franks here, is not so much their kings. We know that their kings start to decline over time. It's the rise of a man called a mayor domus. Those are Latin words. Mayor domus, the main man, the great man of the house. The house referring to the king's house, the mayor domus, or as we would say, the mayor of the palace, or the great man of the palace. Not the king, but the king's right hand man, the hand of the king. The mayor of the palace. He's in charge of the king's palace. This man probably is educated. He probably can read or write. He probably is a barbaric warrior, but somehow can handle administration. So he'll handle the chief's, the king's paperwork. Because you know, who wants to handle that? A king you know, has other things to do than handle paperwork or keep track of things. So this chief administrator will also be in charge of the army. Part of the oath, part of being a vassal, is owing military service. When a king grants you a piece of land, you owe him military service. And so the man who keeps track of that, how much you owe military service, is the mayor of the palace, and so he'll be the one to call up the army. He'll be the to travel out or send his people out to tell you to join the army for do your service as a knight. So it almost becomes his army. That's who you'd talk to if you wanted to get out of service or if you wanted to make some kind of arrangement. You'd have to talk to the mayor of the palace. So it's pretty much his army. You know, you serve the king, but the mayor of the palace controls the army. And we know this. Over time, the Merovingian kings don't do well. After Clovis, there is a clear decline of the Merovingian kings in a decentralized system. You don't deal with him anyway. And so the mayor of the palace becomes really important, and we see a rise of them. We see an improvement of these mayors of the palaces. They get better and better. The kings get worse and worse. The mayors get better and better. The first one we take notice of is a guy named Pepin here in the, uh, in the early 700s. And then his son, Charles Martel. Now again, these aren't kings. These are mayors of the palace. These are the, the king's right-hand man, his chief administrator. It's during Martel's time that there is a Muslim raid from Spain. And again, emphasis on the word raiders here. Um, it is a, the Muslims have taken over Spain, and then they sent raiders into France, into the land of the Franks. And they actually come in in the year 732. In the year 732, there are Muslim raiders from Spain into France, deep into France, all the way near the city of Tours. And there will be a battle there. It's called the Battle of Tours. It's in the heart of France. And it's actually also near the city of Poitiers. It's kind of between these two cities. So some books will call it the Battle of Tours. Some books will call it the Battle of Poitiers. But it's in between these two cities where Charles Martel calls out the army to meet these Muslims. Martel's army of Franks are infantry. This is a dark age, guys. Um, this is a time when the best army he can manage is just an army of men on foot. These knights, these German warriors on foot. They will form infantry. The Muslim cavalry will come upon them. The infantry will form a shield wall and try to hold together as best they can. And they actually win. They will defeat the Muslim cavalry. The Muslim cavalry can't break them. And the Muslims will go back to Spain. 
This is a huge event in Christianity, a huge event for the Franks, a huge event for Charles Martel, that they have stopped the Muslim spread. We talked about this. The Muslim spread seems unstoppable. It's been stopped in the year 732, 100 years after Muhammad's death. He died in 632. Muslim raiders are into the heart of France, but they do get stopped. 732, they're stopped in France and go back to Spain. So the Battle of Tours becomes legendary and super important to the Franks and super important to European history. It'll be immortalized in many paintings. Here's one uh, tapestry looks like showing the French versus the Muslims. Everyone's on horseback because that's a prettier picture. Here's another propaganda picture of the Battle of Tours. This one's more modern, showing uh, Charles Martel there swinging his axe versus these Muslim raiders with these poor women in the middle of the picture. Uh, it's very much propagandistic. On the left-hand side, there's a cross over there to show you where the Christians are versus the Muslims. It's a huge battle of Christians versus Muslims that Christians have defeated the Muslims, driven them back to Spain. Charles Martel becomes known as the Hammer, the defender of Christianity, the defeater of Muslims. Charles Martel, a hero for all of Europe. And then people begin to question, well, where's the king? Why wasn't the king the great hero? He's supposed to be a great warrior. Well, um, they really aren't much to talk about at this point. They're referred to actually as clowns. One of the documents refers to them.